Good afternoon to all of you who are here watching Wednesdays at 1. Appreciate you being with me today. Um, we are going to begin this more, this afternoon with um, the book of Esther. So if you're looking for Esther in your Bible, it is after Ezra and Nehemiah and right before Jonah. So um, it's in the first quarter of the Old Testament. It's before the Psalms. So it's in the section we call the Wisdom Literature. If you have the Lutheran Study Bible, it's on page 774. There's a cheat for you. Um, but I think that uh, if you would make sure that you're in the right place. I want to give you a little context um, before we even begin this story, because I think oftentimes um, this is a good place to go. If you are used to reading scripture, um, either as an answer book or as a, a book wherein to find uh, kind of a model of the godly life in scripture. Like if there's a character in scripture and they do something, then that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> you do need to think about scripture as a library of books. And Esther is among the um, wisdom literature or the historical literature. And herein lies what I wanted to tell you about when we start working in Esther. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, opportunity with the book of Esther because not only do we have the Hebrew text, which you, you remember that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Um, so we have the Hebrew text, which is what we have in the Lutheran Study Bible. It depends on what Bible you are looking at as to whether or not you are reading a translation that came directly from the Hebrew text, or if you are reading a translation that comes from um, a Greek translation of the Hebrew text, which is called the Septuagint. You're going to learn all kinds of stuff you've never heard of before. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, which came as, um, as we moved into the, the era where Greek culture was uh, infiltrating in the, to ancient Palestine and Israel. And, um, and so there were, there were Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible. There were uh, the Latin Vulgate, which were Latin translations of the Hebrew texts. So we have in existence the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And oftentimes that is used um, because there's some, it's a little bit longer. It's got a little more detail and a little bit of differences, some differences um, in the story are different details and things included in the story, very similar to how we see um, Mark being expanded by Matthew and Luke. So the story is basically the same, but there is one particular section that we'll get to a little bit later that is problematic for scholars. And so some oftentimes um, more conservative scholars would insist that we use the Greek text from the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew text. Um, but as I say, the Lutheran Study Bible uses the Hebrew text, so it's the lesser of the two. But the reason that's, that's important is because we have the texts in both of these, we can see how uh, the movement of interpretation has moved from when the Hebrews, when it was written in Hebrew, to when it was then translated for the first time into Greek. Uh, and we can see choices that were made by those who were retranslating, those who were bringing uh, the Hebrew into the Greek language and having to make decisions because there may be some words that didn't translate. Um, so we have those two things. Now this is, that would be way much, way deeper than I am able to, to teach you about, but just be aware of that's one of the special things about the book of Esther is that we have it in original texts in both Hebrew and then the first translation into Greek. So that's, that's kind of cool that we have both of those things. Um, the other thing about the book of Esther that is a great trivia question, um, if you're ever sitting around and you're looking for a really good trivia question, you can ask people, what is the, what is the only book in the Bible where the, where the name God is not mentioned? Esther never says the word God. I mean, not Esther the person, but Esther the book. Uh, never refers to God. And... Um, and so one of the, the one of the things that the, the Greek translation does is to kind of include this person of the divinity that's is obviously there and involved in this, but is never named in the Hebrew uh, texts. 
but in the Greek text, they felt it was, uh, we might be, let's be clear about that. Even though it doesn't really say this, this is what it means, so we're going to be very clear and use the name of God. So, but great trivia question. What's the one book, in, the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God? And that would be the book of Esther. So, a um, couple of things historically that you probably need to know uh, to kind of get your brain into the right place. Remember, uh, we do Pastor Susan's timeline between 1000 BC, which was the reign of David, and zero, which is the, the birth of Jesus, or plus or minus a couple of years. Um, we have the 500s in BC, and the, the, the big deal there is the exile um, from Israel into Babylon, the captivity in Babylon. And that happened under King Nebuchadnezzar, who came and, um, and basically destroyed the, the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem and took the people from the northern kingdom of Israel back to Babylon with him as spoils of war. That happened in 587, okay? Now, we go maybe 50 years forward from that exile where the people were taken to Babylon, and we have the uh, defeat of the Babylonians in 539 by Cyrus of Persia, okay? Cyrus was the king of Persia, and that's where that, and that is set, that, that the, the setting of this story is in the city of Susa, which was the winter capital of the Persian Empire. And this empire was the one that was formed when Cyrus brought together the kingdoms of Persia and Media, so Persians and Medes, as we are here in the New Testament often, um, and, and defeated the Babylonians. So centered now, Persia is, is modern-day Iran, so we are uh, a little to the east of Iraq, which is where the Fertile Crescent is, where the land where Abraham came from. Um, so we're looking basically in the, the modern-day Middle East in the area around Iran. Okay, so now you got kind of got a picture there. Um, but the Persian Empire eventually would reach all the way to Greece and then the other way all the way to India. And that was the, probably... Um, there was, had not been an empire of that magnitude, um, and it was then conquered by someone whose name you will recognize, Alexander the Great, in 330 BC. So it reigned, the Persian Empire existed for almost 250 years, um, and Cyrus was the first um, emperor of the Persian Empire. So um, that gives you a little bit of historical background of where we are. Um, and one of the things that we're going to find out here is that some of the people who are named in here, and they, and this is the story, um, will name people as historical characters, even though um, they are, they were probably characters in history, but they were not historical characters. Um, the name of the king, the name of the queen, as we start out this story, were not are not validated by historical documents that we have of the Persian Empire at that time. Um, so the, the idea of this story of Esther is not just that there was a woman named Esther who was a faithful Jew, uh, and we're going to hear about her story of faith, but it is going to become very similar to the story of Ruth that we just finished. Um, this is going to become, her story is going to become a symbol and an illustration of part of the life of the people of the book of the God's chosen people, the Israelites. Um, so uh, it also is an explanation for how um, the people, uh, the Jewish people got one of their festivals, a modern day festival, or continues into modern day, the festival of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. And so this is going to be an explanation of how that came about and the backstory for that particular festival. So I think that gives you enough of a grounding uh, that we can go ahead and start reading the story. Uh, we will not get through this today. It's a little bit longer than Ruth, um, but I think there's some interesting things. And basically, it's just a story. Uh, it, it kind of, I was pleased to, to recognize this in the notes that I was reading about this, is this is, is kind of like, um, a novella <laughs> or um, or a court tale if you have studied theater and, and how drama came of came about 
This is pre-Greek and Roman drama, uh, but the beginnings of that, um, there was a structure called court tales that were really, um, had wonderful characters, uh, central characters, but the characters were there only to move the plot forward. Okay, so you can tell by the structure of this that it, this is a court tale. Court tales also had some humor and comedy in them, some crazy things that would happen that were, you know, outlandish or whatever. There was a lot of attention to detail in the setting. Um, there were a lot of grandiose kinds of um, descriptions of things that were that were bigger than life. Okay, so as we read this opening part, you'll hear some of that. Lots of characters who you don't really get to know in depth, but everybody has a, a part to play as they're going to move along the story in this court tale. So, um, all righty. I think that's all we need to know about this. So let me go ahead and start reading. Um, let's open now that we've got our history and our roots and our context to go. Let's open with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, once again, we come before you to spend some time in your word. We thank you for this day and for these people who have come together to, uh, to study your history and to study the history that is ours, uh, the history of our faith and the history of the people who lived that faith and brought that faith to us through Jesus. So we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time together. And we ask that you might open our eyes and our hearts to see those things that we have not yet seen or that we have never seen if we've never read or heard the book of Esther. We thank you for her witness and the witness of her cousin Mordecai and for all those who move forward the story of God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have here in chapter one, again, if you want to follow along, because I probably will pause in scenes, but that's going to be quite a lot of reading. So kick back, get a cup of coffee or a soda or whatever you enjoy at this time of the day and, uh, and listen to the story of Esther. This happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the same Ahasuerus, who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. There's a banquet for you. When these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons, without restraint, for the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one desired. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the palace of King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Avakha, Zathar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who attended him, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. At this, the king was enraged, and his anger burned within him. 
Then the king consulted the sages, who knew the laws. For this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and custom. And those next to him were Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven officials of Persia and Media, who had access to the king and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti, because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus, conveyed by the eunuchs? Then Memucan said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will rebel against the king's officials, and there will be no end of the contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be altered, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So, when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the officials, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, declaring that every man should be master in his own house. Okay, so... Got anything, if you've got any questions there or anything you want to know, uh, go ahead and type it on, and I will um, tell you a couple of things if you're, if you're thinking about what you would like to say. Uh, there are a number of legends and thoughts about why Vashti would not have come at the beckoning of the king that came through the, uh, through the uh, eunuchs who waited on her and on and those who waited on him. But let's back up just a little bit. First of all, Ahasuerus um, is not a king of Persia in the historical record. So the idea is that it was probably um, Ahasuerus refers to Xer Xerxes, Xerxes I, who basically was 486 to 465. There's a note on that in verse 1 in the Lutheran Study Bible. So Xerxes is a better known, at least, and is one of the kings of Persia that is listed in historical record. Um, and there is also no Queen Vashti. So those two people, um, why they were named that, maybe to remove it from, um, remove this story from the historical context while still holding this, um, this format of being um, a, a court tale. So it takes place in the court. And if you think about it, there are a number of these court tales that go throughout um, the Old Testament. We have times where we're in the court of King David and things are going on, or the court of King Solomon and things are going on where people are trying to make them do things, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I love Melissa. This makes me think of the end of The Taming of the Shrew. Uh, yeah, yeah, that old Kate, she wasn't going to do it. Now, there are a lot of references to the number seven, number of completion, is 180 also a number of completion? I cannot answer that. Um, I would expect that the number 180 has something to do with the name um, Xerxes, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, and that there's some sort of connection because each of the letters in Hebrew have a, a, a number designation, so that perhaps that his name adds up to 180. Uh, there, I don't think there's any way you can divide that with sevens or tens, uh, 18 times, you know, a um, hundred. 
I don't know that that would make any difference. You got threes and sixes and tens. Um, so, I mean, you could play around with that, but I am not aware. And unless you have a footnote um, that makes uh, mention of that particular number, I don't, I don't know of anything off the bat that would, uh, that would satisfy that. So, sorry, I failed you, Peggy. I don't know about that. Um, if anybody, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, I don't know, you may send Pam off to the research um, of that, but I don't know that there's any specific uh, um, symbolism to that 180. I do like the idea um, that, first of all, they have been um, feasting and having this, this party for 180 days. And then as if that were not enough, they're going to have another seven days of, of partying um, for those who are present in the Citadel of Susa. Now, Citadel of Susa would have been the royal court within the city of Susa. So this is a smaller section of people. Um, but all you can see all of those people who were named in all of the areas, the the roles of people who were named are all you know important folks. Um, so this is this is like a big fundraiser kind of <laughs> banquet where you make sure you got everybody who needs to be there. And you notice um, in verses five through ten um, all the the detail in in describing the the tapestries and the way the place was set up and all the decorations and that sort of thing. Uh, everything to show power and riches and uh, the wealth of the king and the position of the king because of the wealth. Um, the fact that there were seven eunuchs, now there is a number of completions, so apparently if you had seven eunuchs, you had enough of, enough staff. Um, and so, and eunuchs or, you know, were the men who had been castrated for the purpose of serving um, someone of power or someone in religious authority um, so that there would be no sexual dalliances and no uh, complications that would come from those uh, relationships that might pop up on the side uh, for people who were not, you know, who were not castrated. And so, so eunuchs were, a, a, you know, kind of a common way to serve. And there were those who submitted themselves to that so that they could do service in the courts. Um, and so this seems there, there's a list of them here who are um, that people that he can command who had attended him and then others who advised him. So he had different groups of eunuchs that, that um, he could, you know, that he could had, had access to them. And then apparently we also have um, Vashti has a number of eunuchs who are serving her as well. So they were thought of as, um, you know, neuter, gender, gender neutral um, as, gen, you know, there was no, um, nothing that would get in the way of this just being completely subservient and faithful to the person who, who they were serving. I like this idea, though, that while in this last second, second section of feasting and festival of seven days, the king had, you know, another seven days, and the queen removed herself and had her own party. So you can just imagine... Uh, who was over at the Queen's party. You know, she did it at the harem, which was the residence of the women, so it was probably all the spouses um, and the women that she could relax and have, you know, have her own fun uh, with them. And you can just imagine, you know, you get a bunch of women together and they're all complaining about their husbands or bragging about their husbands or whatever. And then, you know, whatever Vashti might have been saying, one of the stories is that... Um, as she was regaling them with tales of life with the, you know, with um, the king, that um, also bringing attention to her place in the royal household, that she has power and status and that sort of thing. And in the middle of that, the eunuchs come in and say, the king commands your presence. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and she's like, uh-oh, I just was bragging about, you know, the authority that I have in the kingdom, and now I have to, you know, just run because he has called upon me like a dog. And so she says, I'm not going to come. Another story that circulates around this is that when it says the only thing that he requests is that she come wearing the royal diadem so that he could show off her beauty, which was great to all of the, these men who are there gathered with him. Um, the story that goes around with that is that it was clear that she was to come attired only in the royal diadem and nothing on her body. 
um, so that he was asking her to come naked and to show her off like a show horse. So either one of those are not attractive, um, not loving invitations from spouse to spouse, and, uh, and were grounds for Vashti to, to refuse and to not come into the presence of the king. So then we get the intrigue begins, and this one Memucan, one eunuch, suggests a way to make sure that what they were afraid of was that if the women of the country, the women, you'll all enjoy this, if the women of the country could point to the queen's disobedience to her husband, then all heck would break loose. We'd be on that slippery slope, boy, and women would just start disobedience to their husbands in all corners on, from all levels of community, and that would just not be good. So, um, so the letters were sent, and here again, now we're getting back into some of the detail. It says, the advice pleased the king and the officials, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, so in it, you know whatever kind of um, writing they used, then then to every people in its own language. So he's honoring each of these provinces by a personal letter from the king, um, declaring that you know by royal mandate every man should be a master in his own house. So one of the reasons why we don't like to proof text in scripture, because I'm sure it, there is a temptation um, to pull that out of its context and say, the Bible says that every man should be the master in his own house. I'm going to leave that one with you to decide what you think about that and how you would interpret that. So a couple of good questions, comments here. So I'm going to go ahead uh, because now we get to meet Esther. Chapter 2. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint commissioners in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in the citadel of Susa, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetic treatments be given them, and let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. This kind of smacks of Cinderella, you know. We're looking for the maiden whose foot fits the glass slipper. <laughs> so the decree goes out to all of the land that anyone who is a young maiden should come and try on the slipper, come to the ball. Now there was a Jew in the citadel of Susa, whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. So he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with King Jeconiah of Judah, whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had carried away. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his cousin, for she had neither father nor mother. The girl was fair and beautiful, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in the citadel of Susa in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. You notice how they have to keep telling you that Haggai has charge of the women as if to say, yes, there was a man there in charge of the women because you don't want to leave them there by themselves without a guy taking care of them. The girl pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetic treatments and her portion of food, and with seven chosen maidens from the king's palace, and advanced her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not reveal her people or kindred, for Mordecai had charged her not to tell. Every day, Mordecai would walk around in front of the court of the harem, to learn how Esther was and how she fared. 
Now, just a little um, sidebar here is, in the Greek text, Mordecai is already a member of the court. And one of the reasons why um, commentaries say that that was done, so that the translation was tweaked a little bit so that he could already have been part and parcel of the court, but that would give him access to Esther and her story and to be able to continue to uh, relate to her as this was unfolding, because obviously once she enters the king's harem, no other male would be allowed to have contact with her, with the exception of Haggai, who had charge of the women. So there are some of, some of those kinds of little details that are fleshed out a little bit in the Greek text uh, that we are not really spelled out in the Hebrew text. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that um, this means that Mordecai um, was, um, excuse me, he was um, related to Kish, who was taken away with King Jeconiah of Judah into captivity. So there's some semblance, some, some thinking that maybe Mordecai himself had been um, in exile in the captivity. However, if you're dating this against the dates of the Persian kings and, and this time, um, that would make him well over 100 years old. So uh, that's kind of, kind of a weird thing. Um, so it doesn't really say in the Hebrew text that he was exiled, but the Greek text kind of alludes to that a little more strongly, but that throws the chronology off. But that's also another way that, that um, scholars and interpreters would say, well, then this is not a his an historical account as we mean historical. This is a story that comes out of this time uh, and some of the details about the, that lend themselves to the story are very important, but the details around reality of a, of a chronological real history of someone who lived and walked and, and that sort of thing, that is not the intent of this story being told. It is a court tale. For entertainment and then also we'll see how it becomes a symbol uh, for the community of Israel and then also as the foundation of the festival. So um, I'm at now 2.12. The turn came for each girl to go in to King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regu regulations for the women. Since this was the regular period of their cosmetic treatment, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and cosmetics for women. When the girl went into the king, she was given whatever she asked for to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she went in. Then in the morning, she came back to the second harem in custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She did not go in to the king again, unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. So um, the delighted in her has a sexual overtone. Uh, it is not necessary to, I mean, I don't know that they were um, sleeping with the king. Depends, I guess, on his mood. If he was pleased with them, maybe he had intercourse with them. If he was not pleased with them, uh, then maybe not. We don't really know that it's not spelled out. But the fact that they were oiling themselves, doing their cosmetic treatments of uh, six months with myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. The skin uh, would have soaked that. I mean, you know, when you come and you get oil of, you know, frankincense and myrrh on your forehead or in your palm or in some of the ways that we use it in worship, you know, it smells for a whole day. Can you imagine rubbing that into your skin for six months? You would reek of the stuff, you know, so there were no bad smells <laughs> with these women as they came in to see the king. It was a delight for him. And, it, you know, once they had been with him, then, um, you know, they would then become one of the concubines, whether they had slept with the king or not, um, and then would be available for him to call upon at some point um, when they were summoned. Um, I did want to mention here this whole thing with Mordecai kind of advising Esther and how to be and what to do and what not to say and what to say and that sort of thing. There is this kind of a Cinderella story in here, and you can see there that kind of the character of um, the fairy godmother and Cinderella giving her all the advice about the ball and all this kind of stuff. So you kind of wonder, and I don't know this to be true, but you kind of wonder if uh, the Cinderella story came out of maybe 
some of the thinking about this, or if that was just a common theme, that there's a king who needs a wife, they send a, you know, a, send a message out to all of the kingdom, you know, saying that, you know, the king needs a wife, so y'all come, and, you know, then what happens is different in each of the stories, but kind of interesting that those characters become sort of template characters for future stories. Um, so when the turn came for Esther, daughter of B Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had adopted her as his own daughter to go in to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was admired by all who saw her. When Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. Of all the virgins, she won his favor and devotion, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet to all his officials and ministers, Esther's banquet. He also granted a holiday to the provinces and gave gifts with royal liberality. So Esther um, comes in, she wins, you know, she wins the prize, she gets to be the queen. Um, and we see here not only um, the, the machinations of Mordecai before she even enters the race, and then during the race she curries the favor of uh, Haggai, who is in charge of the women, we, let us not forget. But um, she pleased him and won his favor, and he provided her with her cosmetic treatments and her portion of food, and then gave her seven maids uh, to, to wait on her in the harem. So she was already in the good graces of uh, Haggai, who was um, one of the king's uh, closest advisors. So she's, she's working the system here, and she knows what she's doing. Okay. Um, questions, comments? Okay, so at verse 19. When the virgins were being gathered together, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her kindred or her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuch, who guarded the threshold, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Ahasuerus. But the matter came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, both men were hanged on the gallows. It was recorded in the Book of the Annals in the presence of the king. Okay, so now we're getting Mordecai um, into the king's good graces, just like Esther. Um, whether this was a stroke of good luck or whether, you know, that's what Mordecai was doing, hanging out by the gate, because you will recall, in ancient cities, they were walled, and the gate was the place where people would come and go all out of this one entrance. So that was where the bulletin board was. That's where people hung out. That's where people did business and made, um, you know, made their covenants with one another and was a place where people could listen to other people and watch other people and uh, sometimes learn things that might be of value to them, as Mordecai did that day at the gate. Um, okay, oh, I did want to mention to you, um, there's an interesting word here, and I don't believe, I don't believe it is footnoted in the Lutheran Study Bible, but in one of my other Bibles, it said the word gallows in Hebrew is a variety of different kind of things. We think of, you know, like the, you know, you, you walk up some steps on a wooden platform and that's where you are hanged and you drop down through the hole and that sort of thing. Um, it could have been that, but it also could have been probably probably not a hanging in the sense that we think of a lynching or a hanging uh, in modern times. Probably this was more a platform where there was a spike and the people were hung on the spike um, in a kind of a, a precursor of crucifixion. 
So it was the kind of thing where a platform needed to be built and the spike needed to be um, supported by this platform so you could get up to the top of the spike. So some of these were really high up. Um, and then they would take the platform down so that no one could, could aid the person who was hung on the spike. Sometimes they were just hung there. Um, you know, I'm not sure how if they, um, I didn't follow that up, but just hung up there to basically to starve to death and die. So it wasn't a, a real exciting way to die, but it's also not, I mean, if the vision, when you say, when we say gallows, I think of the Wild West and cowboy stories and stuff where they string in somebody up on the gallows outside of town. Um, I don't think that's exactly what was going on, but um, I, I really do. What what I read about the, the spike um, just sounds a whole lot like something that would be a, a precursor of the Roman cross. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I've got a question here. Why did the eunuchs become infuriated? Ah, let us check and see. Um, you know, it does there's nothing here and I don't know, I can look before next week though, I will check because if the Greek text, um, has anything about, let's see, this is today, verse 21, about why they were made very angry. Those are the kinds of things that the Greek text then, when they have the opportunity to answer these questions, okay, um, you know, that, that then when they retranslate the story, they add the answer to the question in the story. So I'll look at the Greek the Greek text, the Greek translation, and uh, see if there's anything about why they were angry. It could be just that they're, you know, sick and tired of serving this guy. Um, you know, they were probably not treated much better than any other servants or slaves that, you know, even if this was a vocation uh, for a, a eunuch to serve, um, that maybe they got tired of serving. Who knows? So I'll, I'll check and see if I can find anything on that. Peggy says, my footnote says impalement. So when they talk about gallows and hanging, they're not talking about hanging from a rope, I don't think. So um, just thanks, Peggy, for that. Okay, um, anything else that we catch in there? Questions? Let's see if we can get through, I think we can get through chapter three. So let me start reading the three. After these things, King Ahasuerus prom promoted Haman son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? When they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would avail, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated, but he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Let me uh, fill in there what's going on with that. Um, one of the things about Mordecai not bowing down to Haman was, first of all, you know, Jews would not have bowed down to anyone but God. Um, but there's something else here as well. I think there's a footnote, yeah, a 3-1. Haman, it says describes the, the Agagite, and that is that he was a follower or someone who had come from Agag, who was a king beforehand, and he was an evil king. And so that it was like saying, you know, I can't think of a really good example, but, you know, somebody who follows, you know, a, a Nazi, <laughs> okay, you know, a follower of Hitler. So, you know, so, and uh, Haman was a Nazi. But he descends from the Amalekites, or Amalekites, sorry, mispronounced that, the Amalekites. 
who were the descendants of Esau, okay, with Jacob and Esau. So we're talking about this is an Arab race, okay, Esau was the father of the Arab race, J uh, Jacob was the father of the Jewish race, hence the, the problems. Um, and um, so the Amalekites, uh, I'm sorry, I had that wrong. Um, it was, let me get my, Isaac and Ishmael of the, 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 the patriarch of the Arabs and the Jewish race. Ishmael, the cast out one, was the one who fathered the Arab race. And Isaac, obviously the Jewish people came from him. But the Amalekites were the descendants of Esau. Uh, again, Jacob and Esau. But um, the Amalekites were not, um, they were always making trouble in the tribes, okay? So the people who were descended from the Amalekites, who descended from, from those, were always making trouble. And so there was a point at which, um, and I, I'll see if I can get a little bit more on this story. I just read it briefly about the fact that um, no Jew would ever bow down to an Amalekite because of the Amalekites' cruelty and viciousness. It's kind of the same enmity that was happening in Jesus' time with the Samaritans and the rest of the Israelite people. Um, you know, you just look down on Samaritans because they were half-breeds and, you know, they didn't worship the God right and that sort of thing. Amalekites and, and, the, and the Jews had that same kind of already uh, bad blood between them. So that's one of the reasons why Mordecai would not, there were a number, but there, that was one of the reasons why Mordecai would not have wanted to bow down um, to, uh, King, to Haman. So continuing, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, P-U-R, which means lots, whether they were, you know, bones or uh, dice or stones of some sort, but they cast lots um, before Haman for the day and for the month, and the lot fell on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the promised provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it into the king's treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people as well to do with them as it seems good to you. <clears throat> um, just a note, 10,000 talents. A talent was a day wage. Okay, So we're talking more than 30 years worth of pay, uh, which is what he was, Haman was willing to pay to get rid of, you know, to settle the debt or to settle the score, not the debt, to settle the score uh, against the Jews that he had. So uh, then the king's secretaries were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, and here we go again, and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahas Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces, giving orders to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation, calling on all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went quickly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Okay. Um, I passed by quickly the word satraps. 
which you may not be familiar with except for in the story of um, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we read at the end of the Easter Vigil, that's the last reading of the readings, um, that the satraps and the, you know all of the officials uh, were there. Satraps were appointed governors for the provinces, so there were satraps who were governors appointed by the king, and then there were governors of the provinces who were, you know, either, you know, born into it or whatever. But there were two divisions. There were those who were appointed by the king and those who just had the governorship under however, uh, that, I don't think they voted for it, but probably people who got it by dissension in their, in their, um, in their family. So, okay, so basically Haman's rage um, starts to extend its way around the country. And we're talking, you know, huge empire of many, many provinces. And this word is starting to trickle out that on this one day, um, everyone should be prepared to just basically go and annihilate the Jews um, and see how history repeats itself. I mean, one person gets it into their head that an entire race of people need to be eradicated um, Sometimes they have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, so you can see how some there is some amazing ugliness in Scripture, and this is where we're going to find in uh, when we carry on next week um, how a story, how stories like this um, just just yeah sounds like Hitler exactly. Um, you know how these stories that continue. Uh, the eradication or the captivity of or the whatever that the people of God through Israel, you know, um, never really had it good except for under King David. So you can certainly understand why King David was their guy. Um, why does Haman have so much influence with the king? We don't really know um, other than Haman was somehow, you know, maybe one of his soldiers or something had earned his favor, but we don't get that. That's another thing. Honestly, I will check that with the Greek text as well. Um, three. Why Haman? As I say, when you retranslate from the, the original text, maybe maybe they have um, clarified that. Maybe they've answered that question in the in the Greek text. So um, I think you probably, if you're interested in that, and I know um, you could probably Google the Greek text of Esther and find a copy of that. Or if you have in your Lutheran Study Bible, if you have the Greek, it would be in the Apocrypha, okay, which would be, in fact, I was going to look at that. And I think we do have that. I don't no, I don't have it in this one, so it's probably not. But if you have a, if you're using a Harper Collins or uh, any other Bible that has the Apocrypha, between the Testaments there should be a section of things that have like Maccabees and Susanna and Bell and the Dragon and Esdras, um, and uh, so all these different books that were written about the same time as some of these other books, but they weren't really, they weren't canonized. And as we go through this, you're going to see why Esther eventually was canonized, but it was the last book to be canonized uh, as part of the Bible, um, or the last book in most Bibles. Lutherans, you may know, have not closed the canon. So if we find something new that we want to add, we can do that. But everybody else pretty much has as the Roman Catholic Church has closed the canon. So there are books that are in that ap ap apocrypha, uh, which means additional books. And, uh, and so if you have a Bible that has the apocrypha, look for the Esther that's in there, and then you can compare and contrast. Okay? So that is all I have for you today. Um, and Melissa, what a good word to, to own. Being chosen by God is never the easy option. Amen to that, sister. <laughs> um, yeah, and we see we're seeing it now. I'm I am enjoying doing some new study for me in the Old Testament. I I have overarching knowledge of the Old Testament, but not specifically like I do of the Gospels. Um, so this is fun for me to do the research to help walk you through 
uh, some of these things and learning some stuff that I didn't know. So thanks for the suggestion, and we will uh, we will pick up with Esther in Chapter 4 next week. So that will be July the 8th. Happy July, everyone. And I will not see you until... Um, unless you're in the in the uh, racism conversation tomorrow evening at 7. And if you're not and want to be, just send me an email and I'll send you the invitation for the Zoom. Um, but on Sunday, I will either see you in person at Outdoor Worship um, or on Sunday morning, you will see me, not in person, but like this. Um, and I'll do, we'll see that at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So. Have a great rest of the week. Have a safe and sane 4th of July. Don't do anything silly. And I know this is probably political, but I don't mean it to be. I mean it to be healthy. Wear a mask. Okay. Okay. I will see you all again. Have a great day and be blessed.